and thank you very much for having me as part of this course. Uh, it's always been absolutely terrific, and uh, I'm grateful to be part of the faculty. So thank you very much to the organizers. Um, so, you know, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, setting the stage, perhaps, for some of the things that will be discussed in much greater detail throughout the day. Um, um, and I'll certainly talk about uh, the surgical uh, treatment of uh, tumors, but I'll also talk about the things that we do that are non-surgical because um, it's important to know the surgical indications and the non-surgical ones uh, as well. Um, you know, I think we've come a very long way in the last uh, decade or two, certainly. Um, I think we have a pretty good agreement about indications for surgery and uh, what the treatment recommendations are in general. Um, probably one of the biggest revolutions in how we treat these patients is uh, stereotactic uh, radiotherapy, and uh, you'll hear some really great talks about that. Uh, coming up, um, and it has also changed uh, why we operate, how we operate, um, and I'll talk about that. Um, and then the surgical technique evolution. Now uh, we have things like separation surgery, which uh, combine the concepts of SBRT and actual surgery. We have minimal access surgery, uh, certainly integration of neuronavigation, fenestrator screws, uh, and I suspect we'll hear about uh, carbon fiber screws um, as well. Um, here are some examples of how things have changed. You know, I think we've gone from uh, needing to do a really massive surgery for some part to control tumors to being able to control them without surgery, um, with SBRT. Uh, we've really been able to decrease the risk of uh, postoperative complications in terms of incisions by integrating minimal access techniques. So we have these terrible wound breakdowns less and less nowadays. Um, and then we can go much shorter and be much more targeted in terms of the actual surgery that we do for various reasons. Um, and we'll have examples of all of that. Um, I think the goals of therapy actually have stayed the same um, throughout all this time as uh, the techniques were evolving. Uh, it's res restoration, preservation of neurologic function and spinal stability. With that, we get pain control. And then of course, we need to make sure that the uh, result is durable and the tumor doesn't become a recurrent problem. Um, I'll use the GNOMES framework, which was developed by Dr. Bilski, and I'm sure you'll uh, hear about it when he talks next, um, as the framework for talking about uh, how we make these decisions and uh, you know where uh, surgical uh, techniques actually fit in. Um, and I think the key part of this is this is a team sport, um, and you know I think the faculty lineup today illustrates that as well. Uh, but it, it really helps to have a tumor board, and it's helpful to have a tumor board that meets pretty regularly, even if there aren't too many patients to discuss every time, because these decisions have to be made in real time. And then we'll go through these individually. So the neurologic is the first component of GNOMES, uh, and that's whether the patient has myelopathy, radiculopathy, or severe compression of the spinal cord. I think the main message here is that when somebody can't walk and has severe neurologic deficits from spinal cord compression, time is spine, and uh, we have to figure out what to do for these patients pretty quickly. Um, nowadays, the data support reasonably well the role of dexamethasone, which can be neuroprotective, um, and surgery for uh, decompressing the spinal cord and the uh, urgent timing of surgery if somebody can't walk, because we have data to show that the earlier you decompress, the more likely they are to walk. And we also have a way to differentiate these tumors radiographically in the sense that you know, one of the main differentiators is um, whether somebody has spinal cord compression that's severe or not. Um, oftentimes now, we, um, uh, the medical oncologists and radiation oncologists know when somebody has back pain with cancer, the, the first thing to do is to get an MRI rather than try non-surgical management and, and be conservative about it as we would for somebody with a de degenerative spine problem. So we're able to pick up these tumors pretty early. So most of the time we're picking them up before they cause severe problems, but we're still part of that decision. And so the main differentiator is, does the patient have true compression or displacement of the spinal cord? or not. Um, so is it high grade or low grade? And um, I'll show you how that's important. Uh, the second component is oncologic. Uh, the tumor histology, what type of tumor this is, and whether it's going to respond to chemotherapy radiation or whether it's actually something that needs to be surgically decompressed or removed. Um, a lot of the work has been done to um, determine which tumor histologies actually are radiosensitive and respond well. 
And so we uh, divide these tumors based on their tumor histology into radiosensitive and radioresistant. Uh, I think our understanding of this is evolving and we're actually starting to integrate some of the molecular information as well and into making these decisions, not purely histology. But I think we know that tumors like lymphoma and multiple myeloma are quite sensitive and you know they melt when uh, we treat them with radiation. Here are some examples. This is a multiple myeloma epidural metastasis causing spinal cord compression. And after a few fractions, the spinal cord is entirely decompressed after radiotherapy. Same thing with a prostate metastasis um, in the setting of spinal cord compression. So these patients didn't really need surgery. And now we have radiosurgery, which is incredibly effective in treating radioresistant tumors uh, under appropriate circumstances. So this is a renal cell metastasis that's uh, ablated by uh, high dose, a single fraction of radiosurgical treatment rather than needing surgery. Um, I'm sure you'll hear a lot about this graph from uh, Dr. Bielski and Dr. Yamada in their talks, but uh, I think it's really, really important how things have transformed. Now with uh, high-dose stereotactic radiosurgery, we can actually ablate these tumors independent of histology, volume, and even prior radiotherapy treatment. And that flat red line is what um, is really critical. That's uh, a line that shows that the risk after high-dose single fraction radiosurgery of recurrence is just about 2%, even if you follow these patients out for four years. So, so far I've been talking about radiation and non-surgical things, um, and there's clearly a surgical role. It's that red box on the bottom right corner. It's really uh, in the setting of the uh, spinal cord compression by tumors, uh, in the setting of radio-resistant tumors causing symptomatic spinal cord compression. Um, and the data for that were provided by the Patchell study from many years ago, and I think that's still the bedrock for our indication for surgery. They showed that patients with uh, symptomatic spinal cord compression from solid tumor malignancies do better in terms of ambulation, preservation, restoration, uh, pain, um, and uh, 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 continence, um, and there was even a slight survival advantage. So clearly surgery still has a role and uh, this is one of our strong indications. And the second one in the era of uh, uh, SBRT or radiosurgery is creating the right circumstances for radiosurgery. So the goal is when somebody needs to be treated with radiosurgery, we need to be able to deliver a good enough dose to the entire tumor volume, including the epidural space without putting the spinal cord at risk. And hence the concept of separating the tumor from the spinal cord by doing surgery. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, the third consideration and potential indication for surgery is mechanical instability. Uh, we look back to the white Punjabi definition that was adapted um, to uh, uh, ne uh, neoplastic scenarios as loss of spinal integrity as a result of neoplastic process associated with movement-related pain, uh, symptomatic or progressive deformity, and or neural compromise under physiologic loads. And these remain our surgical indications in the setting of uh, mechanical instability. Clearly, we have a lot of ways of doing it. This can be done with percutaneous cement uh, augmentation, a combination of cement and percutaneous screws, uh, and open techniques. And then finally, the survival assessment. What's the extent of uh, patient's expected survival and medical comorbidities? And can we actually deliver the uh, therapy that we'd like to, uh, that we planned? Um, uh, we have uh, instruments to uh, predict survival, and some of them have really evolved and are quite good. This is an example of the SORG nomogram developed at MGH. This is the evolution of that SORG nomogram, which is an online calculator that anybody can use. <clears throat> It actually requires quite a few data points, but uh, it's quite accurate, um, especially for patients with short and long survival. <coughs> um, one of the things that I think will still require a lot of work is our ability to uh, get more accurate in terms of predicting who is really going to survive, let's say, 90 days. And even these uh, nomograms have some challenges. Uh, when we look back 20 years, um, it was interesting to see that uh, the 90-day mortality after surgery remains quite high and it hasn't really changed that much over the years. It's somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. Uh, so hopefully we can do better in terms of picking the right patients for our surgery and uh, really uh, uh, predicting who's going to survive uh, long enough to truly benefit from the operation. Uh, histology still plays an important role, not just in radiosensitivity, but survival. And, you know, really the, uh, the change over the last 20 years in terms of survival has been very incremental. It's only about 1% a year. So I know that there's a favorable thing to say about the upward slope of this, but it's, it's really quite small. Um, and so we have a lot more work to do. So putting it all together based on the cases that I showed in the beginning, um, where do we operate and where do we not? So this is a solitary renal metastasis. And for many years, this was a, 
uh, a clearly surgical case because we didn't have any options for treating it otherwise. And surgery would have been quite uh, massive. And uh, sometimes we still do this, but uh, I think uh, less and less so. Um, so surgery could have been something like this. You know, this would be an on-block resection of the tumor. Uh, it's a really big undertaking with uh, pot uh, potential morbidity. Um, uh, but that was the only way to treat this. Um, now we have radiosurgery. And so a patient with a compression fracture can be treated as an outpatient with kyphoplasty, and that can be followed uh, as an outpatient with SBRT with ablation of the tumor, uh, not requiring massive surgery uh, under the right circumstances. Um, going back to the surgical indication, somebody with metastatic spinal cord compression that's symptomatic um, uh, from a solid tumor malignancy, such as um, in the uh, case being shown on the left. This is a patient that we now treat with separation surgery followed by SBRT. Um, and I know there are many other ways of doing it as well. Um, uh, but, you know, this is uh, what I have the most experience with. So that's what I'll talk about. And I think that more and more of us are really starting to integrate this type of uh, surgery and treatment techniques into practice. Um, so the indication, um, as I mentioned earlier, is for uh, spinal cord compression from solid tumor malignancies and this concept of separation surgery. So instead of being very aggressive and having to uh, remove the entire tumor, um, we can do smaller surgery. We can uh, provide a decompression of the spinal cord that's circumferential, that usually entails a laminectomy and a transpedicular approach to the tumor. Uh, make sure that the epidural space is clean and that there's no compression of the spinal cord from all directions. Stabilize the spine and then participate in the post-operative uh, radiotherapy planning. I think it's really important for us as surgeons to be familiar with the uh, concept of radi uh, radiation uh, and to participate in the post-operative planning. And I'll show you an example of why that's important. Uh, the steps of separation surgery are fairly straightforward. First, we usually stabilize the spine. Then we do a posterior decompression, a laminectomy, uh, usually at least uh, the level of the tumor and maybe uh, half a level above and below perform a transpedicular approach to the ventral epidural space in the vertebral body, uh, remove the dorsal lateral aspects of the tumor that are compressing the spinal cord and uh, infringing in the epidural space, identify the posterior longitudinal ligament. That's where most of the tumor will be located as they grow from the vertebral body backwards into the spinal canal. So finding that plane is really important. Um, you can do that with the dissector. Then section the posterior longitudinal ligament to actually expose the ventral epidural tumor, debulk it. Um, and um, this is what it looks like on an ultrasound. I find that a very uh, helpful uh, intraoperative imaging technique in these situations. Here you see that there's epidural tumor compressing the spinal cord and displacing it backwards. And when we're done with separation surgery, the ventral epidural space is clean and there's no more compression of the spinal cord. That's the, the typical post-operative construct looks like on uh, x-rays, um, CT myelogram for radiation planning, post-operative uh, treatment. And here's an example why it's helpful for us to participate in the planning of the post-operative therapy. If we don't, uh, then the, the radiation oncologist may not necessarily know that it's important to spare the uh, incision from um, uh, and minimize the dose. Um, and here's an example uh, uh, on, on the left uh, where that discussion wasn't had. And so uh, this is actually conventional radiation uh, showing that the incision is getting fairly uh, hefty dose of radiation in post-operative setting, putting the incision at risk for uh, breakdown. Here's uh, uh, something that's more focused around the tumor um, uh, to be delivered stereotactically, but you can see that there's still quite a bit of uh, radiation dose posteriorly where it's not quite necessary, and here it is tightened up, and the incision will get truly minimal dose uh, and minimize the risk of post-operative uh, breakdown. Um, the tumor control can be quite durable as well, um, as long as the dose is high enough per fraction. And so this uh, type of therapy works quite well. Um, and then finally, integration of uh, minimal access techniques, um, minimizing the incisions and uh, the actual surgery. Here's an example of a 56-year-old woman with metastatic non-small cell lung carcinoma. She was undergoing radiotherapy for the treatment of an L3 metastasis. Um, and in the midst of radiation, um, uh, she started to experience really severe lower back pain and severe leg pain with standing. She couldn't actually lay down for the treatment, couldn't um, actually go to the treatment. And so um, she needed surgery. And so she had an L3 uh, metastasis causing a burst fracture with extension into the pedicle. And she also had an L5 metastasis as well. 
So if we were to do open surgery in the midst of radiation, we'd really worry about wound breakdown with uh, involved our plastic surgery colleagues. Um, if we were to do the classic long constructs, uh, the L5 metastasis would be a challenge as well, and we'd probably end up going into the sacrum. But um, we can also use uh, fenestrated screws and percutaneous instrumentation to go short uh, and then uh, do kyphoplasty for the L3 and L5 levels um, as necessary. Um, this is an example of what fenestrated screws look like when you're administering cement. Um, uh, and so they've allowed us to go much shorter on these constructs. Navigation certainly helps, especially with minimal access techniques, uh, with uh, hardware placement, um, as well as decompression. Um, and there's an algorithm that uh, we developed um, in order to help you uh, decide about what types of uh, uh, minimal access techniques you may want to use, whether it's decompression, whether it's percutaneous instrumentation in combination with cement or cement alone. Uh, and this is really based in fracture morphology and symptoms. Uh, we have some data to show that the quality of life improves after these uh, therapies. And so uh, pain improves, the uh, mobility improves. Um, and uh, we have some factors that can actually be used as predictors of outcomes. So tumor location, lumbar tumors, uh, patients with uh, any type of disability certainly benefit quite a bit from this type of surgery. Um, uh, and it didn't really matter what type of surgery, actually. You know, the, as long as the indication was sound, uh, people did well. Uh, and same thing for instability. The more unstable the patient is, the more symptomatic and uh, clearly the more likely they are to benefit from uh, your stabilization. Uh, some conclusion, uh, NOMS uh, provides uh, excellent framework for making decisions uh, uh, when and how to operate on these patients uh, and integration of SBRT and evolution of surgical techniques have made us much better delivering care for these patients. I think I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. Ilya, fantastic overview, great slides, great visuals. Thank you. I have a question. So this is a complex field. We have complex, amazing technologies available. Uh, we as surgeons like to be or consider ourselves the captain of the ship. But now here comes my question. Who should be in charge of a uh, spine metastasis patient? Uh, if we use a football analogy, are we the quarterback? Are we the running back, uh, uh, just kind of a skills player? Where do we fit into the big evolving landscape um, of multidisciplinary, multidimensional care and decision making? Um, great question. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get some of it wrong as I, I talk about it. Um, but, you know, I think the emphasis is on the team, right? You know, you mentioned a whole bunch of different positions, but they all play together to succeed. So, uh, you know, I'll go back to the concept of making decisions together and the team and board. Um, and I think as long as we work together, uh, we will do much better uh, as a team uh, that treats the patient. But I do think that there are certain things perhaps where it's really important for us to be the captain. Uh, and perhaps they will lead to me saying, maybe we should be the captain. You know, the timing, for example, right? You know, uh, we know that there are certain things that we need to intervene on uh, acutely. Uh, and perhaps involving us in the majority of the decisions, especially if the team is not a very well-oiled machine that knows how we make decisions together, is important. Because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think, and I, you know, I think Dr. Bilski has a whole talk about this. You know, uh, making these decisions in an acute setting when uh, somebody's losing ability to ambulate, rather than letting the whole team take some time to figure these things out. Perhaps uh, we serve as the captain of that team, as the captain of the ship to say, look, we've got to decompress this patient now, and then we'll make all the decisions later. Let's get that right. Okay, so, so that uh, was a great answer, very diplomatic. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts uh, for your future pol political career. Um, uh, so kind of a tag team kind of an approach uh, with changing role plays, uh, uh, from what I gather. Uh, one reality um, that Dr. Patchell has published on, actually, and there are several publications now to support that, is that most tumor patients, for some reason that nobody's figured out, come in on Thursday and Friday nights, and uh, they don't play according to the rules of uh, hospital admissions policies. So Monday morning when the tumor board meets a week later, they don't like to show up. They come on Thursday night and Friday night. So I'm going to ask our faculty member, Dr. Theologis, from the other coast, from San Francisco, 
How do you handle that? Is that uh, a revolving team play kind of the concept? And how do you handle the slowness of tumor boards, which are a wonderful institution to try to make decisions, when right now one of my partners is in the OR with a 300-pound incomplete cord injury patient? So how does that work in reality from your end, from your left coast? Uh, great question, and I think it comes down to the fact that the team doesn't change. So uh, we also have a, sar a sarcoma tumor board, uh, which I'll talk about um, later this morning, but um, we have the cell phone numbers of all the members on that tumor board, so the patho pathologist, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, and it's actually a pretty small group. So if there's a patient who comes in Thursday night or Friday morning or anytime on the weekend, um, I reach out to my colleagues um, by text or call and uh, we have that discussion uh, real time. So I think it just emphasizes the importance of having a, um, a consistent team and um, and I think that, that really ends up making it work really well. I'll ask our co-chair, Dr. Mendel, but um, our oncologists frequently won't even see a patient until we have uh, a biopsy taken. Um, are we behind the eight ball here, uh, Dr. Mendel? Are we de facto the quarterbacks or the secret wannabe quarterbacks who uh, uh, involve others? Uh, what are your thoughts and how do you want to challenge Dr. Uh, Laufer's thought that we're kind of just all role players? So I think that it depends on the context of the situation. If the patient is neurologically intact, it's and the patient shows up on a Thursday or Friday, it's one thing. But uh, you know the situation gets much more complicated when somebody comes in who's neurologically incomplete, has some weakness in the leg, and a quick decision making uh, needs to be happened quickly. And as you said, Jan, sometimes tumor board is not. Uh, you know, it's just not enough time. And uh, it's a Friday or a Saturday or a weekend, and decision-making has to be made very quickly. So I do the same way that was mentioned. We have several cell phones. We reach the ones who uh, are typically involved with these tumor boards, and we make a quick decision-making. And I think those decisions are mostly in the context of patients who are showing up and they have and neurological uh, problems. The ones that are that can wait will wait for presentation in tumor boards, but it's the ones who present with uh, neurological issues and the, the concept of whether we can take them to surgery for decompression or whether the medical comorbidities are too high. So a quick decision making has to be made and it's done at the level of the attendings uh, as much as possible. Uh, even though there are residents and fellows involved, it's really an attending to attending conversation whether it's a, our colleague in radiation oncology or the specific medical oncologist who takes care of these patients. So as much as we try to put it in one bucket, I think it's, a, it's an individualized case-by-case -case scenario. But if you have the infrastructure to be able to reach your colleagues, even at an, uh, you know, ungodly times, then I think it makes, a, it makes a big difference. So cell phones, direct uh, attending to a daily conversation is very critical on the patients who are coming in, either that they don't have a diagnosis, they're coming in, it looks like tumor, but you don't know what it is, and you think about taking this patient to surgery, or they have a diagnosis, but they're presenting with neurological issues, and you think about taking them to surgery. So I think attending to attending conversation, medical oncology, radiation oncology is very critical. Which gets back, I just want to add to, uh, you know, talk, I want to ask Ilya a question. If you have a patient with highly radiosensitive tumor, like a multiple myeloma, as you mentioned, or a prostate cancer, uh, highly radiosensitive tumor, but they are presenting with neurological uh, deficit, um, what's your threshold of how much of a neurological deficit is reasonable not to take into <laughs> surgery versus when to take into surgery when they have, you know, significant neurological uh, Deficits. I mean, if you have somebody with multiple myeloma with severe core compressions or coming into the ER and they have two out of five strengths in their legs that's been going on for a couple of days, would you be inclined to take them to surgery or would you go in with radiation? Uh, at, the, at the risk of uh, giving you a politically correct answer, I, I would say it depends on the circumstances. I'm just going to go back to the, the first thing, that, uh, just to finish that conversation. I, I hope it came across in my uh, talk that 
I do think that we are the stewards in many ways of neurological preservation. So I absolutely do think that we should be the captains of that ship in that scenario. Yeah. Um, you know, I was really talking perhaps more uh, for the broader context, you know, when the things are being decided in the outpatient setting. But I do think that as in most places, when a patient shows up on a Thursday or Friday night with a spinal tumor, uh, the default and the correct default is to get neurosurgery or orthopedic surgery, spine surgery involved. And I do think that uh, we should be involved in all decisions uh, where there's neurologic compromise. Absolutely. So I think that neurologic preservation is key, which leads to, I guess, you know, your, your question about uh, patient multiple myeloma. So I think everybody likes to ask that question, but most of the time when these patients show up with multiple myeloma that's advanced enough to cause spinal cord compression, their platelets are about 2,000. So uh, I think that's one of the real and important considerations. Um, so I do think we have to prioritize neurologic preservation and restoration, but it has to be done in a, a safe setting. So if a patient doesn't have a major contraindication to you taking them to surgery and, and doing it safely, I think it's much easier and I'll sleep much better at night knowing that I decompress somebody who is acutely decompensating in front of me, leading to a severe neurologic deficit and preventing it. However, that's usually not real life, right? These patients oftentimes, especially the ones with these nice radiosensitive histologies present with a lot of medical contraindications. They're in the midst of chemotherapy that's failing and they're failing everywhere. Their bone marrow is wiped out. Uh, and that's usually when they present with these decisions that you have to make. And I would say that somebody presenting with platelet count that's completely wiped out with a bone marrow I would much sooner uh, make a case that they should start radiotherapy right away on high dose steroids rather than me taking them for heroic surgery that's going to lead to pretty much nothing, right? Um, so you know, I think it's a balance and, you know, there's no clear cut answer there. But I would say that if you don't have a, a serious contraindication, prioritize neurologic preservation and decompress anybody who might eventually benefit from radiotherapy. I'd rather be wrong and not overthink it and know that I did the, the right thing for the spinal cord. Uh, one more question, if I may, uh, Ilya, so great to have you here. Uh, Dr. Michael Yang asked, uh, can we, in a patient who has a presumed radiosensitive tumor, can we predict post-radiation kyphosis or instability? I thought that's a great question because it goes beyond the SINs or the NOMS uh, scores. And uh, that kind of a prediction of collapse um, in patients who are getting radiation is a really good one, especially like with the multimyeloma or the plasmacytoma kind of an example. Yeah, great question. So actually, uh, it's a topic of a lot of work that we're doing uh, at, at, through AO right now, Knowledge Form Tumor. Uh, you know, we have a specific focus group uh, uh, that's looking at various considerations of instability. So we're not good at predicting how instability will evolve. Yeah, that's that's very fair to say. I think that the real-time decision is, is the patient stable or unstable, right? And you can use SINs to help you decide that. The key there is whether they have mechanical pain with movement, um, you know, all radiographic stuff aside. So if they don't, you're not absolutely compelled to stabilize them uh, at the time. Uh, and you can probably treat them with radiotherapy. Um, because, you know, again, uh, what's, what's your threshold for stabilizing somebody prophylactically in a way, right? Is it the fact that they have 20% risk of collapse? Is it the fact that they have 50% risk of collapse? But I will say that in a certain population where somebody has high-grade epidural tumor extension, for example, Let's say it's something that like prostate. So they already have some spinal cord compression. They're not neurologically symptomatic, but they do have a compression fracture. I would actually think long and hard about stabilizing that patient, let's say with perk screws prior to radiotherapy, because any type of fracture progression in that setting could lead to neurologic deficit. And I think that's a reasonable indication. I think the potential for progressive deformity most of the time, we don't really know what to do with that. We don't even know what the real implications are of this progressive deformity uh, in terms of quality of life. You know, I'm sure we've all seen a ton of patients with these nasty kyphotic deformities and fractures that are completely asymptomatic. And we never feel compelled to correct them. One last question um, about separation surgery. How do you time radiation after the uh, after the surgery? Is it within the hospital a couple days post-op, or is it a couple weeks later after the incision is healed? Depends on your team, I think, in many ways. So, um, you know, if you have uh, again a well-oiled team and you guys work well together, uh, what you know we used to do when I was uh, at uh, Sloan Kettering was uh, actually do the simulation while the patient was recovering after the radiation. 
uh, meaning, you know, you do the surgery within a couple of days, they undergo a post-operative CT myelogram for the radiation planning. And then once that plan is done, you know, that's usually probably another week after uh, after the actual uh, sim, they can go to radiation because I knew that Dr. Yamada was going to know that, you know, we need to be careful about the incision and the dose to the incision. So we didn't really have any hard and fast rules. As soon as uh, the radiation team was ready, we'll let them proceed. And that's with SBRT, by the way. Conventional, you know, I, uh, unless we're really pushed, I'd say, you know, wait three, four weeks, but that's not exactly separation surgery, right? That's just decompressive. Um, but it really depends on the institution, you know, and, uh, now I don't quite have that very well oiled machine. Uh, and so, you know, the, the radiation time becomes somewhat variable just for practical reasons not so much for the actual me worrying about the incision. Hey, we'll have to explore some of those topics later. Again, really enjoyed your talk, the content, and the thoughtfulness um, that you put into this and your expertise. I hope you can stick around a little bit so we have more um, discussion opportunities and your input uh, benefit. So thank you, Ilya. Uh, you mentioned uh, cement, and I think we have a live lab uh, with Dr. Oskuyan, and I'd love for you, Ilya, to criticize Dr. Oskuyan.